Can I make a confession? Being a father is absolutely the hardest thing that I have ever done. And I say that not because of anything my kids have done wrong. I love my kids. I'm, I'm blessed to have two amazing children who I'm incredibly proud of. The reason why being a dad is the hardest thing that I've ever done is because it is an incredible responsibility to be the curator of two little souls. And what I have found in parenting is that whatever flaws are within me tend to be passed on to those I'm responsible for curating. Any parents notice this? It's like every time your kid does something that disappoints you, you realize they're just reflecting you back to yourself. Parenting is hard. But you know, as much as I am aware of my imperfections and my challenges as a parent, the one thing that I am completely convinced of is this. I will never abandon my children. No matter how bad it gets, no matter what decisions they make, I'm not going to turn my back on my kids. I'm never going to walk away from them. And I have this kind of thought in the back of my head that a good father just doesn't abandon his kids. It's like a baseline level of expectation. And it is that observation that makes the death of Jesus just a little bit harder for me to comprehend. Because in the darkness of Calvary, when Jesus is experiencing the agony of crucifixion, we are told that God the Father abandons God the Son. Jesus himself tells us as much in Mark 15, 34. These are the only words Mark records Jesus saying on the cross. Now, we know from the other gospel writers there are other things Jesus said while on the cross. These are the only words Mark records. And they are words that come from Psalm 22, which Jesus would have learned when he was a little boy. But now these words express what Jesus is experiencing. He cries out from the cross, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani which is an Aramaic phrase that means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In the moment that he's about to die, the Son of God experiences abandonment by God the Father. Jesus the Son, the one who is so close with the Father that he correctly says, I and the Father are one. In this moment, the Father turns away from the Son. Now that Jesus was abandoned by his closest friends is sad enough. But to be abandoned by the Father in heaven, this is a heavy, hard, difficult thing to understand. Why should the Son be abandoned by the Father? Well, it is now noon on Good Friday which means Jesus has been on the cross for three hours. And in that three-hour time period, we saw last week, Jesus endured an immense amount of physical suffering, but he also endured the shame of being insulted and mocked by nearly everyone who passed by. And it's at noontime that Mark shares with us a supernatural occurrence that happened in Jerusalem that day, Mark 15, 33. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. So in the middle of the day, it got dark for three hours. And mind you, this is not a natural phenomenon that's happening. This is not some kind of eclipse that's going on. This is a suspension of the laws of nature and total darkness in the middle of the day, and it would have terrified people to have seen it this dark in the middle of the day. How many of you witnessed the eclipse earlier this year? We weren't in the, quote, zone of totality, but it was a little eerie when it got dark in the middle of the day and the birds stopped singing. It was kind of creepy if you think about it. Well, there's this pitch darkness that comes over Jerusalem as Jesus is on the cross. And if you're a reader of the Old Testament, you know exactly why it got dark. 
Because throughout the Old Testament, darkness is a sign of God's displeasure and God's judgment. In the days of the Exodus, when the Israelites were enslaved under the oppressive hand of Pharaoh, one of the ways that God pronounced judgment on the Egyptians was to send a plague of darkness. And throughout the prophets, when the prophets speak about the final day, the day of judgment, when God meets out what we deserve for our sin, it's described as a day of darkness. I want you to listen to what the prophet Amos said the day of judgment will be like. In that day, declares the sovereign Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I'll turn your religious festivals into mourning and all your singing into weeping. I'll make all of you wear sackcloth and shave your heads. I will make that time like mourning for an only son and the end of it like a bitter day. What Amos tells us is exactly what the darkness means. In the moment that Jesus dies, judgment day comes upon the world. And so Jesus dies in the dark because in the moment of his death, he is bearing the punishment for human sin. The father abandons the son because abandonment by God is the ultimate penalty for sin. In our sin, we turn away from God and God's judgment on sinners is to give us what we want and to let us walk away and to turn and walk away from us. And the Bible says that the ultimate consequence of sin is death. And fundamentally, what is death? It's to be separated from the God who is your life source. If you are separated from God, you cease to exist. And so Jesus is abandoned by God the Father. He dies. And he's doing that in our place. Not because he sinned, but because he is taking upon himself the sins of the world. So the Apostle Paul has a few ways that he speaks about this moment. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, Paul writes this. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is anyone who is hung on a pole. What is Jesus doing in this moment? He's becoming cursed for us. Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus knew no sin. He never sinned, but he became our sin. He takes our sin upon him. This is what's happening when the Father abandons the Son on the cross. And Jesus knew it would be this way. In the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus decided that he would do the will of the Father, that he would drink the cup of suffering and of God's wrath, he knew that meant being abandoned by God the Father. And so in the moment that Jesus cries, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is doing that for which God sent him into the world. He is paying the price for human sin. And after three hours in the darkness, three hours of this abandonment between the Father and the Son, Mark records Jesus' final moment. Mark 15, verse 37. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. Now the way that Jesus died is noteworthy. You see, most victims of crucifixion, it took them several days to expire. Jesus dies in about six hours. Most victims of crucifixion, at the end, they're so weak, they can hardly utter a word. Jesus screams out. 
And Mark doesn't tell us what he said in this loud cry, but we learn in John's gospel what the words were. The words were, it is finished. The work that Jesus came to do, to to die for human sin, it is finished. He's experienced the abandonment of the Father. He's taken on our punishment. And so Jesus decides it's time to die. And this is just the thing that we've got to get into our, our minds and hearts. Nobody took Jesus' life on Good Friday. He gave it away. Six hours in, he should have had a long way to go, but it was over. It's finished. And so he breathed his last, and he gave up his spirit. And in the moment that Jesus dies, a second supernatural occurrence happens in Jerusalem. And it happens just down the road in the temple, where the curtain in the inner sanctuary of the temple, this massive curtain is torn in two from top to bottom. That curtain that was in the temple was a visible symbol of the separation between a holy God and unholy people. So it divided the holy of holies from the rest of the world. The holy of holies was the very center of God's presence on earth, and nobody could go behind that curtain except the high priest, and even he could only do it once a year under very strict limitations. Why? Because we're sinners. We're an unholy people. We're not fit to stand in the presence of a holy God. And when Jesus dies on the cross, he takes upon himself our punishment. And the veil is torn, the curtain is torn in two, which symbolizes this. There is now new access to God. Through the death of Jesus, there's no more curtain. We can walk right into the Holy of Holies. We can stand in the presence of God. Why? Because by Jesus' wounds, we are healed. By His sacrifice on the cross, we are made holy and righteous. By Him giving Himself up in our place, He gives to us the access that he has. So that just as he had direct access to the Father, so now do we. The death of Jesus on the cross tears the curtain in two. And so as all of this is happening, as the darkness comes over, as Jesus cries out, as Jesus dies on the cross, there is at the foot of the cross a Roman centurion. And he is the leader of the detachment of soldiers who are carrying out the executions on Calvary that day. And there's a good chance that this fellow has presided over many, many crucifixions before. He's witnessed many people die. But he never witnessed anyone die like this. And in watching the way that Jesus died, he feels compelled to make this confession. He says, truly, this man was the Son of God. This is a pagan Gentile centurion. He hasn't spent any time studying the Old Testament. He doesn't know anything of Isaiah's prophecies. He hasn't spent any time in Sabbath school or in prayer. And yet when he gazes upon Jesus and witnesses what he's doing on the cross, he can only come to this conclusion, this is the Son of God. And his confession is a foreshadowing of what will happen to millions and millions and millions of people thereafter. That when we gaze upon the cross and we see what Jesus did there, and when we truly understand what was happening in the moment of his death, we can only conclude this, truly he was the Son of God. You know, this morning is All Saints Sunday, and just a few moments ago, We lifted up the names of those members of our church family who have died in the last year. And and all of us 
experience grief. And all of us have lists of loved ones who've gone before us who have died. And, and because of the cross of Jesus, because Jesus is the Son of God who died, we, we proclaim this truth today that we do not die and experience abandonment by God. That's not what death is like for us now. As a matter of fact, in the moment of death, God promises not to abandon us. God promises to walk with us through the valley of the shadow of death. Why? Because Jesus died on the cross. You see, here's what you've got to know. Jesus was abandoned by God so that you and I don't ever have to be. And in the moment of our death, the veil has been torn. Our access to God is already sure. And not even the power of death can separate us from the goodness of God. In just a moment, we're going to come to the table of Holy Communion. Holy Communion is that time when we proclaim the death of Jesus. Isn't that what we do at Holy Communion? We lift up the bread. We say, this is his body broken. We lift up the cup and say, this is his blood shed. We're proclaiming the death of Jesus. And the death of Jesus is an invitation for Holy Communion. It's an invitation for us to be united to God through a relationship with Christ. Do you realize what Holy Communion tells us is the death of Jesus means you have access to God. You can be in communion with God. You can be so close to God that just as Jesus said, I and the Father are one, you could say that too. Holy Communion is our opportunity to, to receive the benefits of the death of Christ. Is the death of Christ full of sadness and darkness and mourning and pain? Absolutely. But the tearing of that curtain tells you what it made possible. And it made possible for you and I to come stand in the presence of God and to be able to be received as daughters and sons of the Most High God. And so we come to this table as those who look to the cross not as a sign of suffering and shame, but we look at the cross as the throne of Christ's glory in which our King gave his life for us. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the cross. And we thank you for the, for the compassionate, the loving, the merciful sacrifice of Jesus who took our place, who experienced abandonment so that we don't ever have to. And as we come to this table today, we pray that the curtain would be torn in two, that we would experience a true holy communion, the opportunity to stand without blemish in your presence, all because of Jesus, the one in whose name we pray. Amen.